Whether new shooter, longtime gun owner, or even police officer or soldier, your handgun needs a Crimson Trace laser sight or light. Get the confidence and reliability you need to protect family, home, and country. Crimson Trace. Lock and load. It's time to load up on some intellectual ammunition with Tom Gresham's Gun Talk. It doesn't matter if you learn to shoot with Daniel Boone or you're brand new. You're welcome here. This is the original national talk show about guns. And Tom Gresham is your guide through the maze of ballistics and politics. So grab your phone and call in right now. 866-825-5486. Or just dial 1-TOM-TALK-GUN. Now, here's Tom. Broadcasting nationwide, this is Tom Gresham's Gun Talk. Your views, advice, and questions are the driving force of Gun Talk. Call Tom now at 866-TALK-GUN. That's 1-TOM-TALK-GUN. Or reach out to us via email at tom at guntalk.com. Let us know what you think about the gun-related issues of the day. Now, here's Tom Gresham. All right, we're still talking about guns. We're going to be talking about gun rights for just a little while right now because uh, this stuff is hugely important. I've been I've been covering guns and gun rights well pretty much all my life. One of the leading lights when it comes to scholarship on the Second Amendment is Stephen Hallbrook. His 1984 book "That Every Man Be Armed" was the first book on gun rights on the Second Amendment at least in modern times, and is still considered a standard. Everybody's got to have that on your uh, on your bookshelf if you want to really know the history of the Second Amendment, where it came from, and what it means. It's a real pleasure to welcome Stephen Hallbrook on right now. How are you, sir? I'm great, Tom. How are you today? Well, I am doing great. You have argued uh, cases before the Supreme Court, have won cases, Second Amendment cases. You've written books. You are a leader in scholarship on the Second Amendment. You've been doing this, it seems like, practically forever, at least as long as I can remember. Well, I don't want to date myself now. Let's let's watch out. <laughs> it, it's been a long time. That Every Man Be Armed actually came out in 1984. Yeah, 1984, that, that Every Man Be Armed. And I actually am thinking about that book as well as your latest book, which is Gun Control in the Third Reich, Disarming the Jews and Enemies of the State. And I see a, at least one very strong parallel, and that is you can't fully appreciate the situation that you're in unless you know the history and how you got to it. And that every man be armed, traced you know, the history, I mean, going way back to, even to the ancient Greeks, to the Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms. And you went to great lengths in this book, uh, Gun Control in the Third Reich, to not say the whole deal of, well, you know, that's what Hitler did, so that's what they're trying to do now. I mean, you really went out of your way to say that's not what you're doing. But at the same time, i got to tell you, when I'm reading it, I'm getting cold chills because I'm, I'm seeing what happened back then and thinking, boy, there are some real similarities to what I'm hearing now. Well, one thing that's a universal um, thing about human experience is that there will always be people trying to control other people it's a mm. pendulum between freedom and slavery in various degrees. Sometimes it's better, sometimes worse, sometimes it's intolerable. And what happened in Nazi Germany in terms of disarming the Jews and enemies of the state, so-called, uh, and what happened in our own before our own revolution when uh, the Crown tried to disarm the colonists, you see that as a universal fact of human experience. And so uh, one thing that we always want to do is study our history and, and learn where we've been and maybe have some insight into where we're headed. But the, the Second Amendment expresses, once again, a, a universal principle that people who want to be free have to be armed, and they have, there has to be a lot more to it than that. But having that tradition and a tradition of, of loving liberty and limited government, those are things that have made America free. And Unfortunately, that's a tradition Germany didn't have, and um, it was very easy to enact gun registration in the 1920s by the Weimar Republic, and it was also very easy when the Nazis came to power because they had the registration records to to disarm all of their enemies. You make an excellent point here, uh, and that is people say, well, you know, uh, 
What do you mean? Why are you worried about uh, registration? Because our government would never do that. Well, maybe, maybe not in terms of using registration lists to gather up the guns. But actually, it wasn't even the Nazis who registered the guns. It was the government before the Nazis. And whether it was benign, whether it was not, it was actually the ex- the mere existence of the registration list made it possible to confiscate guns. Right, and what was incredible, they, they had the same debates in the 20s in Germany that we have today. Uh, those who want to be overly restrictive and others saying that you're disarming the wrong people, uh, mm-hmm. disarming law-abiding people doesn't help any. Uh, but the proponents of the gun control measures prevailed, and but when they did pass registration, they warned that the records have to be carefully guarded and and um, not let fall into the wrong hands and the hands of radical elements, as they called them. And, and guess who took power, though, in 1933? It was the wrong hands, the radical elements. And they had the records. They were able to centralize them. And, by the way, they had the uh, uh, the punch card technology by then. They didn't have computers, but they you know, were getting to centralized mm-hmm. record-keeping. And right. so uh, there came a time when the Nazis first came to power. They violently attacked all of their political enemies, disarmed all of their political enemies, uh, number one, the Social Democrats, mm-hmm. uh, and then moved on to the Jewish population, but particularly in 1938, the Night of the Broken Glass. All of that was preceded by the disarming of the Jewish population. What happened to make you decide to write this book? Because there's a lot of research in it. Did you, I, I get the impression that maybe some documents or some research became available that we didn't have before. Well, the, the book is based primarily on archives from uh, German archives that, that nobody ever researched before. There's books on everything about the Third Reich and World War II and all of that, but no, nobody's ever covered the essential component of disarming people. But um, it goes way back. I mean, we've all heard, like you said at the beginning of the show, that, um, well, you know, here's a proposal. Somebody's going to say that sounds like something the Nazis would do, and, and no, they would never do a thing like that. Well, this this took place in 1968 in Congress. There was a debate like that where um, registration was being proposed. It was defeated. Uh, but the proponents tried to claim that um, the that was not an experience that uh, people had under Nazi Germany because Congressman John Dingell, who's still there, bless his soul, mm-hmm. uh, raised that issue. It had only been, what, 23 years after the war ended, and he said, this sounds like the kind of thing that happened in Nazi Germany. And they said, no, it would never happen. That There was no record that the Nazis had ever used records to, to disarm anybody, which was phenomenally crazy because they had records on everything. They had a blacklist of, you know, if, yeah. if you weren't, uh, if your name went on a blacklist, you weren't anybody in those days. And uh, so that sparked my interest. I was a young man, and I've, I've uh, done research ever since, but about 15 years ago, I seriously researched it and um, got possession of all these archive documents, and, and that resulted in the book. One of the things I, I kept coming back to as I'm reading the book uh, and by the way, it's available on Amazon. It's available in Kindle as well as in printed form, so it's easy to get. Uh, we've got it on our website. If you go to guntalk.com and look at Tom's picks, it's one of my picks there. Uh, Stephen, one of the things I'm struck by was the very idea, and you make this point, is what they did is they banned firearms ownership to certain groups, not based on activity or behavior or you know, you've, you've been convicted of a felony or whatever, but just the fact that you are in this group means you can't have a gun, much like uh, actually has happened in the past in the U.S. But you know, they, I guess the first they started with gypsies, and then they, even before they went to the Jews. I mean, they just said, if you're a member of this group, you can't have a gun. That's right. I mean, we have our own parallel, uh, the laws against uh, African-American people having guns during slavery and then in the black codes after the Civil War. That was mm-hmm. done away with, but I suspect there was a lot of Jim Crow um, enforcement of the same kind of things uh, in, in the old days. Uh, but in, in Germany, it did start with the uh, gypsies, and then 
uh, but the way they, they, that was the only ethnic group that was named, but the way that they were able to bring the Jews in before they were officially brought in was that uh, the police had the discretion to determine if a person was a danger to society or to the state. And, and with that, it, they had that under the Weimar Republic, uh, a democratic form of government. But um, when the, the Nazis came to power, they, they simply only needed to say, well, we're not going to issue gun permits to Jews. This, this came out of the Gestapo in 1935 uh, mm-hmm. because they're a danger to society and to the state. And, and so it's that absolute uh, police discretion that allowed them to do that at first. They didn't put the word Jewish in there until 1938 when they uh, banned specifically banned gun possession by Jews. It's, it's that old deal of people, very smart people have said, don't judge a proposed law by what it could do if it is uh, enforced fairly, but look at the damage that could be done if it is enforced unfairly. And that's where discretion comes in. So well, you, you can trust the police, but what if you can't? If you give them discretion, what, how much damage could they do with that? And that's what you're pointing out. That's right. And it, it was even broader than that in those days. They uh, the Weimar Republic gave the executive power the discretion to uh, suspend civil liberties in an event of an emergency. And you can see what happened with that. I mean, we had the same thing on a, a mini scale and, and when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. I mean, basically yeah. civil liberties were suspended. Suspended people were disarmed. It was, it, it was lawlessness declared by the police chief, basically. So, yeah, absolutely, um, the mayor and the police chief, yeah. That, that's right. So <laughs> I, I like what you said about what, what can happen with something, a power given to a governmental entity uh, in its worst case as opposed to its best case, because the way to hell is paved with good intentions. And uh, a, a lot of what was enacted in uh, Germany before the Nazis took power it was well intended, but, but look at what it can do. And that that's why... We have our Second Amendment, and we have a tradition of, of bearing arms in this country, and that's been a, a great um, uh, way that we've preserved our liberties. What kind of reaction have you gotten? Uh, you have done a lot of scholarly work in the past, and this one, I think, is getting toward the edgy side, where it's going to make a lot of uh, academicians, uh, people, uh, scholars, maybe nervous, the whole conjuncture the, uh, of Nazis, gun rights, gun control. What kind of response are you getting to this? Uh, basically a, a, a positive response. Uh, I, I did find it rather incredible that one of the, the liberal media uh, interviewed me and um, for an article, basically. You know, the first chapter in the book basically talks about, well, here's an issue that people have debated in our country and other countries, and why don't we just look at what happened? And, and there's no more mention of any kind of current discussion in the rest of the book. Right. And the only mention in this liberal media that was made of what's in the book was that first chapter. <laughs> it was like, we do not want to talk about this. Uh, we're going to continue our attitude of denial. Um, so basically, yeah. I'm hoping in the long run uh, that there will be more scholarly discussion. Uh, historians, for some reason, it's like a big blank spot if you read the rise and fall of the Third Reich by uh, William Shire, for example, you will not see one mention. What, what's that, a thousand-page book, right? Mm-hmm. Not one mention about uh, disarming anyone. Uh, and and wow. all, there's several books on Kristallnacht, The Night of the Broken Glass. And um, if it's mentioned, it's basically in a footnote. Wow. Well, I wish you lots of luck with it. I think it's an important book. And I, for those who are truly interested in Second Amendment and in gun rights, I got to say there now I have to say there are at least two books you must have and one is your first the 1984 that every man be armed and the other would be this most recent one gun control in the third reich because I got to tell you as I'm reading this thing I keep I'm hearing the voice of Nancy Pelosi and I'm hearing Charles Schumer and I'm hearing their assurances that we don't want to take your guns away we just want to know who has them and I mean, over the last 30 years, I bet I've heard that thousands of times. And I'm reading this and going, holy cow. I mean, if, if you could just read this, you would understand. And if they could read it and understand it, they would understand why we are so worried about that. Well, then you've got Diane Feinstein saying we want to take them all. So 
it, it's That's so right. deja vu all over again, isn't it? It is. She, she told 60 Minutes, she says, if I could have gotten the votes, I would have uh, picked them all up. Mr. and Mrs. America, turn them all in. That's what Diane Feinstein said. Well, Stephen Halbrook, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for this book. It is important, and I would recommend it to anybody. It is, it, it's huge. So uh, it just continue what you're doing. You are, as I say, you are one of the giants in uh, gun rights and gun rights scholarship. Well, thank you for having me on the show, Tom. It's a real pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, the, uh, the book is uh, Gun Control in the Third Reich, Disarming the Jews and Enemies of the State. This one is worth having. 866-TALK-GUN. Be right back. At Double Tap Ammunition, we hand inspect every round that we make, and we use only the best components to give you the best ammunition on the market. Try us out at www.doubletapammo.com and use the promo code GUNTALK for 10% off your order. You already know Liberty Safes are great values. Now they're offering an even sweeter deal for Gun Talk listeners. At LibertySafe.com, click on the Fat Boy Safe and type in TOM. Liberty will give you up to $250 off your purchase. Protect the things you value most. LibertySafe.com. Click the Fat Boy Safe. Promo code TOM. Save up to $250. That's LibertySafe.com. LibertySafe.com. The Smith & Wesson Bodyguards. Carry more comfortably, walk more confidently. When it comes to personal protection, nothing beats a bodyguard. Choose the lightweight, compact, and concealable Bodyguard 380 pistol or the Bodyguard 38 revolver, both with a built in laser sight. The Smith and Wesson Bodyguards. Carry more comfortably, walk more confidently. Looking for shooting instruction but don't know where to go? Well, we have it, and you can access hours of training and safety videos, which you can watch on your home computer. On GunTalkTV.com, we have top competitive shooters, the best in self-defense trainers, and folks who have hunted all over the world, helping you learn which gun to buy, how to use it, how to store it safely, and everything else you need to be a safe and competent shooter. We also have gun makers showing off their newest rifles, shotguns, and handguns. Doesn't matter if you're a veteran shooter or a complete beginner, you'll find what you need at GunTalkTV.com. You can check it out for free, and you can get full access for only $5.95 a month. That gives you unlimited access to hundreds of videos, and we're adding more all the time. Run the videos over and over to make sure you understand what's being said. Skip around. You're in control. Get smarter. Shoot better. Visit GunTalkTV.com. Accurate, powerful, consistent. At Double Tap Ammunition, we offer 364 loads in 83 calibers that give you exactly what you've been looking for. Try us out at www.doubletapammo.com and use the promo code GUNTALK for 10% off your order. Got Gun Talk? As we've said for years, be sure and say thanks. Call your local station, or if you see them out and about, let them know you appreciate your gun talk. As for the version we won't broadcast, stick around and participate in the Gun Talk After Show. If you're on hold, tie a knot and hang on a little longer with the Gun Talk crew. Tom, Jim, Michelle, Michael, and you. We'll tackle stuff we don't cover on the (coughs) airwaves. Speaking of the airwaves version, though, here's Tom. All right, back with you here. 866-TALK-GUN will get you in here. 866-TALK-GUN. We'll go to line, to line two first. Uh, Chuck is in Crosby, Texas. Hey, Chuck. Hello, Tom. Uh, a while yes, ago, you had a caller asking about uh, 9 millimeter submachine gun ammo, and mm-hmm. uh, you were discussing uh, submachine gun firing from an open bolt. And, no. my, man, man, that brought back some painful memories. About 1967, when I asked a... NCO, what he meant when he said that the M60 was a great machine gun because it fired from a closed bolt. And like a dummy, I asked, how, how, Sarge, how, how could it fire without a cold closed bolt? <laughs> Man, I, I pushed up a lot of Fort Benning, Georgia, and, and it took me a while to finally get an answer to what they really meant when they said 
fire from an open bolt. Right. Well, for those who don't know, uh, a closed bolt is like most guns. You close the bolt, and then when you pull the trigger, the firing pin flies forward, and the gun goes off. And in the case of a semi-automatic, then the bolt comes back, then flies forward, strips a cartridge out of the magazine, and then the cartridge is in the chamber, and then you pull the trigger again, or you can keep firing. Open bolt, you actually lock the bolt to the rear, and when you pull the trigger, it releases the bolt, which flies forward under spring pressure, strips a cartridge out of the magazine, and fires the cartridge as the bolt hits home on the base of the, uh, the, the cartridge. And there are advantages and disadvantages of each. Uh, an open bolt system with a machine gun, one of the things it won't do, which is nice, is a round won't cook off. You sit there and crank out uh, a couple hundred rounds out of a machine gun, the barrel gets real hot, and then the next round sits there in the chamber, and the chamber is practically glowing red hot, you could have a round cook off, just fire because the barrel's that hot. won't do that with an open bolt because the cartridge is not in the chamber. Uh, but then, of course, open bolt it lets dirt and junk and get stuff get in there, and there is a possibility, maybe a little bit more of a possibility of it going off if dropped. But so that's kind of the, the deal with open bolt and closed bolt. It's not a, an issue for... Most of us, because most of us don't get to have submachine guns, though they sure are fun. So, appreciate that, Chuck. Great story about uh, <laughs> Fort Bidding. Let's see, uh, line one, Walter is in California. Hey, Walter, you're looking for, do you have one of these um, HS Precision removable magazines? No, it's on the way from Brownells. And the reason uh, for it is that I went shooting with a friend of mine who had just picked up the Ruger Gunsight Scout Rifle. Right. Well... After seeing how nice that was, my my Remington ADL was a little bit short, let's put it that way. <laughs> Loading one bullet at a time, I felt like one bullet Barney. But I'd right. seen some videos, and I decided to go with changing out my stock to the Hogue over-molded uh, short-action BDL stock. And I'm going to drop in the HS Precision 10-round magazine bottom metal. Very and nice. Well, HS Precision makes good stuff. Yeah, and I was wondering if you had much experience with them. And do you, I've seen in their video that they say you might have to do like a little bit of uh, work on it to make it fit. But yeah, you, you video, may have I to do a – here's the thing. You may have to do a little Dremel tool work to make it fit, just a little light work there. Uh, if you're not up to it, not comfortable doing it, you might want to find a gunsmith nearby. Or, frankly, if you could call the people at Brown, uh, not Brownells. Um, well, Brownells might be able to help, too, since you bought it from Brownells. But also HS Precision, uh, Tom Houghton over there. Good good people make really high-quality stuff at HS Precision. Basically, you're converting your Remington 700 to a detachable box magazine. It's a cool system. You can look it up either at HS Precision or at Brownells. Hey, when we come back, we're going to have John Lott with us. How cool is that? Tom Gresham's Gun Talk is broadcast nationwide every Sunday. If you can't hear Gun Talk where you live, call your local talk format station and clue them in on Gun Talk. Stay tuned. We're coming right back. Now broadcasting nationwide on radio, via satellite, and through downloads, iTunes, the Gun Talk app, and other podcast clients. You're listening to Gun Talk with Tom Gresham. 866-TALK-GUN. I can't talk anymore. That'd be bad, wouldn't it? It's 866-TALK-GUN is the number here. Give us a holler. Also over on Twitter, I'm at Gun Talk. Tom Gresham here. You can shoot me an email, Tom at GunTalk.com. Having a lot of fun. We're joined right now by uh, truly one of the giants in uh, research and academia when it comes to gun rights. I mean, we're going to go from Stephen Hallbrook to John Lott. How cool is that? John, how are you, sir? Oh, do, Doing great. Nice to follow after Steve. Yeah, no kidding. Talk, talk about uh, a guy who has been there and done that forever. L- let me ask you, I'm looking at your new effort here, the Crime Prevention Research Center. E- essentially, one of the things you're saying is that uh, the Obama White House is pouring millions of dollars, giving it to academics to essentially fake uh, gun control studies that would support gun control. Is that really what's going on? Well, it's not just uh, President Obama. You also have uh, Michael Bloomberg and George Soros and lots Ah. of left-wing foundations. 
they're literally putting hundreds of millions of dollars. I would say, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd use the word fake, but what I would say is that, uh, you know, they know what they want to get at, and uh, and it's pretty bad studies. And the amazing thing to me, really poorly done, and the amazing thing to me is how the media just so uncritically reports them. Uh, and it's mm. a broad range of studies. You have things that are put out by Bloomberg. Uh, when he puts out one of his funded studies, uh, you'll find them getting a couple thousand news hits, which... I mean, you are familiar with the news business. You know that's a phenomenal yep. amount of coverage, and yet it's completely uncritical. And these guys, when you read their funding reports, they're talking about a huge tidal wave of studies coming out in 2016, just in time for the presidential election. Uh, oh. People, you know, I don't think that's by accident that they're coming out then. And I think uh, uh, they're going to force, one way or the other, gun control to be a major issue at that campaign. And, and the thing is, you just can't let these things go unanswered. Uh, just give you a recent study that was funded by Bloomberg that came out of Johns Hopkins. They, uh, it, would get, uh, it, it was on uh, the so-called universal background checks, uh, mm-hmm. you know, on private transfers of guns to make sure that there were background checks on it. And they looked at Missouri. Uh, when they got rid of their their private background checks in 2008, saying, look, since 2008, Missouri's murder rate uh, went up relative to the rest of the United States. Well, that's true, but, uh, you know, the way the media was reporting it in terms of saying this proves gun control works, that doesn't follow, because you have uh, 18 states that had these types of laws, you have mm-hmm. to ask yourself why you only picked one state. And the reason why they picked only one state to go and report the data from is that it's the only one that gave them that type of result. The other 17 <laughs> didn't do that. Plus, if you're going to look at when the law is removed, maybe you want to look at what happens when the law was put in place. If they believe that that was responsible for the murder rate going up, then presumably it would have been responsible for the murder rate going down when it was first put into effect in the early 80s. And that's mm-hmm. not the case. When it was put in effect, Missouri's murder rate went up relative to the rest of the United States. And so that type of cherry-picking just isn't serious. I'm not saying that they made up that number for Missouri after 2008, but what I am saying is that uh, it just doesn't show anything conclusion that they want to get out of it. So what, and, what you're uh, saying, what, 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 what I think I hear you saying is that we need our own researchers who will go in, and, and that takes money, too. And that kind of brings me back, uh, I'm going to circle right back to where you are with this new group, Crime Prevention Research Center. You're seeking funding for uh, academics, for researchers who can go in and do real studies and present the real information. Because other, I've always said a lie left unchallenged becomes the truth. And that's what they're hoping to do is throw out so many lies that it becomes accepted as being the truth. That's right. Well, I mean, they look, they've tried their normal approach to this debate, the political approach, and they realize that they haven't won. But they feel that if they can kind of control the numbers that are used right. in these debates, then they can win, ultimately. And, uh, uh, you know, it, I don't think it takes literally the hundreds of millions of dollars that they're pouring in on the other side, but it takes something. But what I was hoping to talk about today on your show mm-hmm. is, this is just a small part of this, but um, in 2008 and 2011, we uh, put together uh, national conventions for students for concealed carry, where we got together academics, We got together students at different universities, and the last time we did this in 2011, uh, C-SPAN rebroadcast the convention um, uh, 11 times. That's pretty phenomenal when you consider that about 47 million people watch C-SPAN over the course of the week, and to have three and a half hour blocks on that, we're able to get across a lot of information. We had academics talking about the research that they had done. I had a debate with somebody from the Brady campaign that I think we won pretty handily. And if people were to go to the crowdfunding setup that we have, I actually have the links in there from C-SPAN broadcast where they broadcast the entire uh, convention there. And they can see 
what we set up and the information that we gave out. And it's just one little way of trying relatively inexpensively to get across the information to other people about uh, what the research shows, rather than just cherry-picking things to try to go and do a systematic, you know, accurate study on these things. So what, uh, we, what we, we need, need here is we've we got to have some funding so that the students for, Demo- for a concealed carry on campus can have this national gathering, right? Right. And it, it's really not that much. I mean, to, we want to have about $30,000, and it okay. breaks down about half of that, 15000 of it, is just provide travel vouchers, about $300 each, so that students coming from more than 750 miles can at least some, have some help with their travel costs. Now, much of the rest of the costs go to hotel rooms for the students, and then we have about $5,000 for uh, actually the facilities and things like that, and then we have about $1,000 or so to try to do PR to get the media to help cover this type of thing. So right, it's right. pretty bare bone type thing. I mean, and so, but basically, uh, there, there's a $20 donation, you know, the price of a cheap box of ammunition. Right. And if 1,500 of your listeners were to call up, or not call up, but just go to there and just put in twenty dollars. I mean, I, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people listen to your show, but if just one thousand five hundred of them were to put in essentially less than the cost of a box of ammunition each, we could do this. And, so how do, uh, where do they where do they go? What, how do we do this? Well, I. I guess you'll be putting up a link on your Facebook page. I don't know if you've I had will, a chance it, to go. It, no, it'll have to be done tomorrow because I, I am not the webmaster. I don't do the Facebook thing. So uh, well, right that'll now, be done tomorrow go, when our, our office opens. Okay. Well, right now they can go to uh, my website, crimeresearch.org, just crimeresearch.org. And uh, at the very top, of the page, there's a there's a little banner that says "Our Indiegogo campaign is live," and if okay. they click there, and then there'll be a list of different what they call perks, and a little ways down the list is twenty dollars that's dedicated just to uh, the Students for Concealed Carry ah, Convention. I mean, they can I go and it. give m- money to other things, but if they and then there's some other things, fifty five dollar. There's a little bit more that they can do there, and then. Uh, um, but, you know, if they go and if we just get 1,500 of your hundreds of thousands of listeners to put up, as I say, uh, less than the price of a box of ammunition, we can do this. And, and literally tens of millions of people will be reached, and they'll get at least some information to go and offset uh, the type of bombardment that they're going to be facing on these issues. Okay. Okay, the the website is crimeresearch.org, dot O-R-G, not dot com, people, listen up. It's dot O-R-G, uh, crimeresearch.org. I just went there. I'm going to click. I'm going to throw 20, well, I'm going to throw a little bit more than 20 bucks into it. You know, that's the other thing. You know, you're not limited to 20 bucks. If you want to throw 20 bucks, go for it. But uh, whatever whatever you can throw in there. John, we're going to see what we can do to help out. We'll put a link to this on our Facebook page. Uh, I'll throw it out on Twitter, and everybody's got it now, and then... Uh, you know, we ought to be able to get this done. We could do this. If each of us just says, hey, 20 bucks, come on. It's just 20 bucks. We could throw that in there. Right. I mean, uh, rather than a night out for dinner, if, you know, this is the type of cause, I mean, all this money will go completely to run the convention if they click that particular perk that's there. And, uh, uh, you know, this is, you're helping out young people. They don't have a lot of money to go and pay for, uh, you know, a trip out there. Uh, but it'll right. help energize them when they go back to their schools. It'll help. We're doing it in Washington, D.C. over the summer where there are lots of students from around the country. We'll try to get them to attend the conference so that then they can get information. And when they go back to college, they can go and push for this. We have nine states now that to some degree allow concealed carry on campus. But... There, a lot of them are close in terms of changing, getting rid of these horrible gun-free zones. But again, if they go to crimeresearch.org and click on the banner, they'll be taken to where they can put in the $20. We'll do what we can do, John. Listen, thank you. Thank you so much for all that you do. You are, uh, you're out there 
as I said, the tip of the spear, you're, you're getting it done. Thank you, my friend. All right, got to run to the break here. 866-TALK-GUN. Remember, it's crimeresearch.org. Uh, I'm already there. Hope that you can join me there. Give me a holler. 866-TALK-GUN. Everyone talks about heroes, people who do amazing things in extraordinary situations. Well, I'm no hero. I'm just a guy who wants to protect his family, to keep them safe the best I can. It's my duty as a husband, as a father, and I won't ever let them down. Introducing the Carry-On series from Taurus, the ultimate collection of concealed carry firearms designed for discreet, reliable personal protection. Visit TaurusUSA.com to learn more. Carry-On. Successful hunters know big bucks move early and late, often when it's too dark for common scopes. When that monster steps out, you might see him through the scope, but the crosshairs disappear. All that work and you can't take the shot. But with the Trigicon AccuPoint scope, you'll get the shot. Its bright aiming point glows in daylight or darkness. No batteries needed. AccuPoint scopes are water-resistant and nitrogen-filled, feature multi-layer coated lenses for the brightest image, and you can adjust brightness of the aiming point to match the conditions. Adding 10 or 15 minutes to each end of the day can double the magic moments when the trophies move. You can't hit the target if you can't see the sights. Trigicon AccuPoint scopes. Check out the different models at Trigicon.com or call 1-800-338-0563. Brilliant aiming solutions from Trigicon. Home invasions happen anytime, day or night. Do you have a firearm close by? You can. And still keep it secure with one of the great wall safes from Console Vault. Plate steel construction, two levels of security, and models which hide in plain sight. Install two or three around the house. Always nearby, but secure. Lock, but quick to open. Visit consolevault.com. That's C O N S O L E vault.com. Hi, this is Doug Koenig, professional shooter and winner of over 60 national and world championships. If you shoot an AR, you need to be running the new Sharps Reliable. This bolt is amazing. The Reliabolt was fired 7,500 consecutive times by an independent test facility, jam free. If you need the peace of mind and safety of not worrying about a jam, then buy the Sharps Reliabolt. Sharps Reliabolt is available at srcarms.com and tell them Doug sent you. famous radio consultant once said he'd be off the air in a year. Whoops! Defending your Second Amendment rights since 1995 on over 150 radio stations nationwide. You're listening to Gun Talk with Tom Gresham. All right. Tell you what, we're joined right now by the the Knoxville gun rights examiner, Liston Matthews, is with us. Hey, Liston, how are you? Hey, Tom. Good to talk with you. Hey, Hey, you know, I just realized I was in Knoxville yesterday. Oh, yeah? Did, you didn't happen to see that P-51 Mustang flying around, did you? No, I didn't. I wish I had. I, uh, I, would, I wouldn't have thought about you, but I sure would have loved to have seen it. Well, I was in it. Uh, great. <laughs> I, I had seen where you were planning on, uh, on flying one, and now you've done it. I ah, have. Yeah, that was a great deal. So you guys have just scored another big win in Tennessee. Yeah, and it, it took me by surprise. I, a few weeks ago, I called you, and, and we had an open carry bill up, and... and uh, it passed the Senate overwhelmingly here in the state, but it was it was killed in a, um, a House subcommittee. But mm. uh, very quietly, there was another bill moving through that was signed on uh, May 1st, and, and it is a vehicle carry uh, bill. It basically extends the domicile, you might say, from the home uh, to the car or to the RV or whatever. Uh, now, I'm not a lawyer, so I may not be using that term domicile exactly correctly. But, but so, I think so basically, you don't need a permit to have a loaded gun in your car in Tennessee now. That's right. Uh-huh. Uh, effective July the 1st. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, July the 1st. Okay, don't run out and do it this month. Uh, but July the 1st, we have that in Louisiana, and it really helps because a lot of people don't have a carry permit, but they want to have a gun in their car. 
Uh, it's also a good way to cut down on the carjackings. Hey, listen, listen. I, I, we're, you knew we were going to be short on time, and I appreciate you getting right to it. And thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, you guys can check out, uh, just Google up uh, Knoxville Gun Rights Examiner. You can read what Liston's doing. He's uh, reporting on gun rights quite a bit online. That is good news for the folks in Tennessee. Uh, starting July 1st, you do not need a permit to have a loaded gun in your car. Very cool. 866-TALK-GUN. 866-TALK-GUN. Your gun question, you can call us right now. Join the NRA via Tom Gresham's Gun Talk website and receive $10 off the regular membership price. Log on to guntalk.com for details. You're listening to Tom Gresham's Gun Talk. Just because we're wrapping up on the air doesn't mean we're done talking about guns. Stick around for the after show. It's our podcast-only version designed to include all the stuff we simply couldn't fit into a regular show. Call in now at 1-TOM-TALK-GUN. Now, back to Tom. Hey, one of the things we're going to be talking about in the after show, I'm going to ask Michelle. She mentioned uh, during the break there when we're talking about students for concealed carry on campus, he says, you know, if you're talking about all these sexual assaults on campus, so this is something we ought to be talking about. So I'm going to ask Michelle to weigh in on that one when we get to the after show. You can be a part of that. Just give us a call, 866-TALK-GUN, and we'll uh, we'll keep you over for the after show. I want to talk to Dave on line two out of uh, Michigan. Hey, Dave, you got a question here. It's kind of interesting. Hi, Tom. Yeah, I'm trying to understand um, the, the reason that Vendors that sell complete uppers for AR-15s sell them mm-hmm. in a configuration that's uh, less than 16 inches, like 14.7 inches, right? With with an unpinned uh, flash arrestor. It it okay. seems to me that if somebody wants a short barrel rifle, wouldn't they want something shorter than just an inch and three tenths? Shorter than the limit. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of with you there. I mean, certainly uh, this would qualify as a short barrel rifle, an SBR, and you have to pay the two hundred dollar tax on it and do the whole federal mother may I deal. Uh, and I'm with you. You know, come on, if if you're going to go short barrel rifle, go short for heaven's sake. So get it down to nine inches or or ten or eleven inches. I mean, some of them go as short as eight inches, but you can run into functioning problems when you go to real short. But yeah, 14 and a half inches? I mean, seriously, are we worried about an inch and a half? I'm I'm with you there. What's that all about? Okay, I, I just wonder if I'm the only one trying to figure out why they why they offer it that. They, they, they offer it with pinned flash arresters. That and, makes sense, because now, now it's a 16-inch yeah, barrel. Yeah, brings it up to 16 inches, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. Now, now the flash pressure counts as part of the barrel, but an unpinned, uh, are people... Well, I was going to say, are they buying it and then pinning it after the fact? But I would think that still, that, that it's an SBR. I think it's not an SBR until you put it on a lower. So you could get it and actually have it pinned uh, if you wanted to, but I don't know. I, I still, I'm with you. I'm scratching my head. I don't know why you do that. Why wouldn't you just buy it that way in the first place? Okay, well, I guess it wasn't I, just me. <laughs> no, yeah, we're, we're we're both here, and now and somebody else is thinking these guys just don't understand. Well, I, I know if you do, if you've got the answer, call me right now eight six six talk gun, and uh, we can either get you on well, we're hard against the break here, but we'll get you in the after show. By the way, if you have not experienced the after show, uh, it's a lot of fun. We've got uh, Jim and Michael and Michelle and me, and we're shooting the breeze and talking about things, and it's kind of a free for all of. Anything somebody wants to bring up, if there's something you want to bring up, fine. If you want to just uh, participate, wave in. Just ha- have some fun with the whole deal, okay? It's it's a lot of fun. Um, the other thing is, if you have not listened to the after show, I would suggest that you would get a kick out of it because you never know. Well, I never know what we're going to say. I sure don't ever know what these guys are going to say because I'm not even responsible for myself, much less anybody else. So there you go. Uh, let me remind you again, um, crimeresearch.org. If you go over there, follow the link that uh, John Lott told us about. Throw 20 bucks into the uh, hat. we got to fund the students for concealed carry on campus get-together. And if we can get about 1,500 of us throwing 20 bucks in, we can fund it. Uh, uh, a little bit goes a long way. It's, it's not tough. Not like the way John said, hey, it's less than most boxes of ammo. Isn't that the truth? 
All right, go out and do some shooting this week. Invite somebody you know to go with you. Introduce them to this wonderful sport. And by the way, maybe you should consider becoming a firearms instructor. We need more of, particularly more women firearms instructors. In the meantime, be safe. Watch that muzzle. Remember those four rules of gun safety. And we'll see you next week. I'm Tom Gresham. Have a great time out there.